Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to the podcast. And just before we get started today, if you've enjoyed listening to our discussions, please share the podcast with friends, family, colleagues and on social media. And if you use Apple Podcasts or Spotify to listen, please leave a review as it really helps us to broaden the conversation. So on to our interview, and this week I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. John Gerardini. John is a child psychiatrist who also trained in philosophy, critical appraisal, and psychotherapy. He has a continuing appointment as a professor in the School of Medicine at the University of Adelaide. He heads Adelaide University's Critical and Ethical Mental Health Research Group, which conducts research, teaching and advocacy to promote safer, more effective and more ethical research and practice in mental health. He has an international reputation for his work on the evidence base for psychiatry and is a strong advocate for addressing the social determinants of mental health. John, together with co-author Lehman B. McHenry, wrote the book The Illusion of Evidence-Based Medicine, published in 2020. The book was followed by an opinion piece which appeared in the British Medical Journal in March 2022. I was keen to ask John about the issues with evidence-based medicine and what led to the debasement of a system originally conceived to challenge extravagant claims and poor science. Dr. Giardini, John, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today for the Madden America podcast. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we're here today to talk about your 2020 book authored with Lehman B. McHenry entitled The Illusion of Evidence-Based Medicine. Um, and this is also the title of an, an opinion piece by you both, um, that which appeared in the British Medical Journal in March 2022. And so I'd like to come on to talk about the book and the paper. But first, I was interested to know a little about you. Um, you're a professor of psychiatry and paediatrics at the University of Adelaide in Australia, and you've written extensively on clinical trials, misleading drug promotion, and corporate influence in medical education. So I, I just wondered, how was it that you came to have this kind of critical focus on these issues? The, the first experience I had of thinking this might be an issue was actually something that seems quite trivial. I was at a conference and uh, it was an exhibition hall of um, drug companies and I raced around and grabbed all the freebies I could and, and I sat down in a chair and looked at this crap that I'd accumulated that I didn't really want and I thought something strange is going on here. So that kind of piqued my interest and I it happened that our professor of pharmacology had put round a series of guidelines about interacting with industry and i I kind of laughed at it. I thought, how sort of Calvinist. And again, after having had that response, I thought that more reflected more on it. Then I ran into a guy called Peter Mansfield, who ran an organisation that was then called Milan, but was um, rebadged as Healthy Scepticism, which was quite influential in its time. And he educated me about these issues. Thank you. And, and again, but before we turn to the book, I, I kind of guess I wanted to ask about the, the concept of evidence-based medicine. So is it just an academic concern which should involve journal editors and researchers, or, or should it also be of concern to the average person in the street? The trouble is the average person's not in a position to appraise the evidence and is therefore re reliant on um, other people to do that. That I think it maybe is a bit of an overstatement because there are people outside medicine who've done a fabulous job, Robert Whitaker being one of them, of, of appraising the evidence. But the average person who's considering decisions about their own health um, isn't well equipped to do that kind of analysis. And so I, I've been accused of scaremongering and I say, no, it's not, it's not me creating the fear. It's actually a very scary business evidence-based medicine and uh, something we should be very concerned about. To get a little bit into the book then, so, you know, firstly, it's a cracking read, you know, I have to say, even though it's quite scary in parts. Um, so the book really, um, it tells a story of the many ways in which the profit-driven motive of the pharmaceutical industry undermines the integrity of science. And you talk of the corrupting influence of commercial objectives. 
And there are many players in this process from pharmaceutical manufacturers and their research and marketing teams to journal editors, medical education providers, and then ultimately, I guess, prescribers. But mentioned often in the book is the role of what's called key opinion leaders. Particularly in psychiatry, key opinion leaders seem to be very prominent. So I wondered if you could describe for us what a key opinion leader is and, and some of the ways you found in which they interfere and influence the science. So a key opinion leader, the term is, is used by the pharmaceutical industry primarily. And what they're looking for are like-minded individuals who share their views about medicine, um, who can be used to unwittingly promote their products. So a typical situation would be a young um, clinician with academic aspirations um, who has some ideas that are broadly sympathetic to the drug company's agenda. And the drug company recognises that and grooms the young academic, helps them in their career. So one of the things that's really hard when you're getting started as a medical academic is to get um, research funding. Um, And, you know, the people who've already been funded are the people who then get funded. So you've got to find a way to jump onto that treadmill and uh, drug company sponsorship for research is um, a good way of doing that. It happens in two ways. Either you get invited to become a chief investigator in a, in a study that's already been designed by a company and, and the duties of the chief investigator are not particularly onerous. You just have to contribute patients and your unit gets well rewarded for that. And you get to go to chief investigators meetings, which are characteristically held in nice cities around the world. So that's one way. The other way is um, investigator initiated research. If I've got an idea about how to use an existing drug, it won't matter much to the company about whether there's any scientific merit in that proposal. They'll want to support me in doing that. Um, They might get a publication out of it with their name on it, but more importantly, they're kind of grooming me as a as a budding academic researcher, and uh, and then able to trade off my reputation. So they'll get me. They'll invite me to give talks in conferences, to participate in company sponsored events at conferences that are, are disguised to look like they're part of the legitimate program, and sometimes they are because companies influence the conference organisers. So the key opinion leader is not generally motivated by financial reward, although there can be, if not direct financial reward to the key opinion leader, certainly to their their academic teams, research teams. But it's about career advancement, really. And if you look at heads of department around Australia, um, and I, I have reasonable confidence in saying around America, you'll struggle to find somebody who has got to a head of department position in psychiatry without having a leg up from industry. It comes across in the book that, you know, the key opinion leaders seem to be amplifying marketing messages of of products really to kind of give a, you know, a seal of approval and contributing to perhaps the ghost writing or ghost management really of of journal articles. So they're they're, they're quite enmeshed in the process, aren't they? Absolutely. And the other thing um, that a key opinion leader can do that a drug rep can't do is promote off-label prescribing. So the company itself is prohibited from promoting to doctors that they should use drugs off-label. A key opinion leader is not. And so the key opinion leader is the person who promotes off-label prescribing with all of the dangers associated with that. Now, off-label prescribing in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing, but Um, most off-label prescribing that occurs in psychiatry is poorly thought out and poorly supported by evidence. Uh, Thank you. And there were some terms in the book that I hadn't come across before. Um, You talk about astroturfing and evergreening. So could you tell us a bit more about those? Well, astroturfing is about fabricating consumer groups. So um, the highest profile parents group for ADHD Um, is actually a drug-sponsored entity. Um, So what you get out of that is a consumer voice which 
can be more powerful um, than something that's coming from industry. It appears to be independent, but it's not. Um, evergreening is when the, the, the real money that's made out of drugs happens uh, during the period of patent. Uh, patents expire. You, usually, I mean, a patent, I think, is usually 20 years. But by the time the drug gets onto the market, there's only a few years left. But if you can come up with a new indication for the drug, you can get a, a, an extension of the patent. And with blockbuster drugs, so that's ones that turn over at least a billion dollars a year. So just 12 months of patent extension is very valuable to, to a company. And so you get these kind of more or less fabricated conditions like social anxiety disorder or female sexual dysfunction that are used purely and cynically to extend patents and make profits for industry. Thank you, John. That's helpful. And uh, again, something that struck me. So in the book, it's mentioned that in the 1800s and early 1900s, the pharmaceuticals kind of extravagant claims for the, the, their drugs at the time were labelled the great American fraud. And this created the need to regulate and police their claims, and I guess ultimately led to evidence-based medicine as an attempt to bring that into line. But after reading your book, I had to ask myself, are we really any better off now in 2022 than we were in those kind of wild times back then? I think we are. And I, and I don't want to denigrate the concept of evidence-based medicine because evidence-based decision-making is a good thing. Well, our concern is that the True evidence-based medicine isn't what's practiced, partly because of the influence of, the, or largely because of the influence of industry, but there are other reasons for that as well. And um, one of the most striking shortcomings in the current approach to evidence in medicine is the absence of strong testing, the absence of rigorously trying to set out to disprove a favoured hypothesis. So what happens mostly in medicine is that people get an idea that they like and they try and massage the, um, the data to support that point of view rather than um, having a good idea and thinking, I'd really like that to, idea to be meaningful, but before I go out there and tell people that I've got this great idea, I want to do whatever I can to challenge the idea. And so... Um, you know, people, drug companies in particular, do bigger and bigger studies with more and more people in them, which makes it more likely that the results are going to reach statistical significance. And the general perception is the bigger the study, the better. But actually, if you can demonstrate in a very small study that there's a significant effect, then that's much more meaningful than, develop it, than demonstrating it in a large study. And in our book, we talk about um, research into scurvy um, in, the, I think it was the 18th century. And there were two patients in each group in that study. Um, but because um, lime juice was containing vitamin C was actually a straightforward preventative and cure for scurvy, it only took a total study of, of 14 people to prove a really important medical development. Um, and so... I think that should stand as a paradigm of um, of good practice. That this that if you can show something in a small study, if it's something stands out, um, then that's much more likely to be meaningful than something that you need a meta analysis of fifteen different studies to show a fractional benefit, which is the case with antidepressants. But talking a little bit about clinical trials, then so. Um in the book, you, you, you go into some detail about GlaxoSmithKline's infamous study 329, which I think evaluated the antidepressant paroxetine, and also Forest Laboratories and um, Citalopram study. And that these are perhaps the more well-known examples, but there are many more, I, I, I'm sure. Um, in the book, you say, in a post-truth world, we want to restore objectivity to the scientific testing of medicines. And that's quite a goal, quite a target, isn't it? So, you know, I wondered how could we start to move toward a place where we can have confidence that clinical trials are free from corporate influence and conducted for science rather than acting as a marketing tool for a particular drug? Well, the, the more or less complete solution to that would be to take pharmaceutical research out of industry. 
and it was put into industry because that seemed to be the economically most feasible um, way of of doing it, um, and it proved to be economic economically feasible for industry, but not beneficial for patients. And it's not the case that industry generously pays for research. Industry passes on all of the costs of research and more in the way that they market their drugs. So they carry out all this research and still make huge profits. And they tell us how expensive research is to do. So if that were all true, then they should be really happy to relieve themselves of the responsibility of research and a tax could be exacted on them um, to cover that research or the money instead of going to the cost of drugs could go to um, government who could then commission properly conducted research. So that's why that's, but th- you know, that's not going to happen. Something that could happen um, would be feasible would be that people carrying out research could only publish their data, not their conclusions or not any conclusions about it, not any analysis of it. Um, and the data would be published on suitable websites with access for properly qualified people who could then analyse the data and report on that. Um, and, and the company could as well, um, but they would have no more access to the data than an independent person would. So there was an initiative called All Trials, um, which attracted a lot of attention, which was a step forward in that it required that trials, proto- the protocols of trials be published and the, and the results always be published. Um, and in fact, GlaxoSmithKline were a big mover in getting that off the ground. And that seems like an, a virtuous act by the company until you know that in a legal settlement, they were ordered by the Attorney General in New York to publish all their trials. So cleverly, they made a virtue out of necessity, made themselves look like great corporate citizens and are big supporters of the All Trials Initiative. So um, you need to be a bit sceptical about uh, supposed positive acts by companies. Um, so somehow the the data, which who do the data belong to? I mean, drug companies say they belong to them and talk about intellectual property. From our point of view, they belong to the participants who've made a sacrifice and a risk in participating in trials. And the, our obligation to them is to make the best possible use of the information that's been generated out of that in the interest of patients more generally. So I think that patient interest trumps intellectual property considerations. And then they play the card of privacy. Well, except in very rare conditions where individual patients might possibly be identified, I think the privacy card is... is strategic and not substantial. It was surprising to read how difficult it was for you to um, access data behind Study 329 and Forest Laboratories. And I I think part of that was just because of um, uh, the information had to be made available as part of legal proceedings, didn't it? Yeah. So we've had a more recent uh, episode. We're we're just finishing off a reanalysis of a study called TADS, the Treatment of Adolescent Depression, uh, which is the, probably the most influential trial uh, of antidepressants in, in adolescence. And we were too late. We By the time we got onto Duke University, um, for various reasons, we were too late to get hold of the individual patient records because they've been destroyed. But in existence and very important were the serious adverse event reports. So there were 60 or so serious adverse events that Duke still had um, the original um, reports that were filled out at the study sites by the people who were carrying out the study. And um, at high cost, they agreed to make them available to our team. And we did some negotiation, got the cost down a little bit, but Um, wrote a contract between our university and Duke University that would enable us to have access to that. And then at the last minute they said, um, actually, we've gone to our ethics committee and we can't give you those um, documents because they can't be sufficiently um, redacted to protect the identity of the patients, which was clearly 
untrue because I'd already provided the same documents to Columbia University in an earlier analysis of suicide in antidepressant trials. And so what was equally interesting was that we went to our university and said, hang on, um, let's please support us in enforcing this contract that Duke have already entered into. Um, but our university uh, wouldn't do that. Um, we got uh, an American law firm to support us, but again, our university wouldn't let us uh, pursue that legal means. And then when we wrote the whole thing up, our university wouldn't let us publish any of the correspondence that we'd have with them about it. So uh, one of the things that we do go on about in our book and in the and in the opinion paper is about the way in which academic um, institutions have sold out to industry more generally and and how concerning that is. So you said how difficult it was to access the data. When, when the regulators come to approve a drug, so MHRA in the UK, FDA in the US, and I guess similar in, in, in Australia, do they get to see the raw data from trials or is that not part of how approval is given? Um, I think that their access to raw data is, um, I think it's possible for them. I mean, I'm, this is not an area of expertise for me, the way in which regulators interact with industry, but um, my understanding is that they are often quite accepting of what's fed to them by industry. And certainly I've been involved in one case where the judgment by the the FDA was in fact a cut and paste from documents submitted to them by, by industry. But there are famous cases of people in the FDA taking a proper interest in what um, is being presented to them. Unfortunately, they don't seem to have been well supported by their uh, by their agency when they've tried to do something about that. They've been um, treated very poorly and had to be whistleblowers rather than um, it being resolved within within the agency. And we know there's a revolving door with people within the FDA um, working their careers towards senior positions within industry, and the FDA funds, uh, sorry, is funded by. Um, pharmaceutical licensing fee. So the, that relationship is far too close and blurry um, for patients to feel safe. I guess then, you know, also linked into that, you know, the, there's this whole kind of web of interlinked parts of the puzzle, aren't there, in, in terms of how industry does its influencing. And the book also says that political lobbying by the pharma, pharmaceutical industry is the single most important factor in the corruption of the regulatory system. And it, it goes on to say the pharmaceutical industry is the largest lobby in Washington, D.C. So, you know, I, I wondered, you know, in your research and writing for the book, you know, how, how does influencing politicians kind of contribute to the debasement of evidence-based medicine? It's interesting because in Australia, being a, a small jurisdiction, there are two or three psychiatrists who more or less own the public discourse and political discourse in, in Australia. And while you know, their, their entanglement with industry is not huge, by you know, they, they've got to the stage where they get all the funding they want from government, nevertheless, they... Um, experienced significant career advancement through their engagement with industry. And although both speak strongly to social determinants of mental health, they um, are always sticking up for pharmaceutical intervention. So with the recent publicity about, um, you know, the final putting to rest of chemical imbalance, um, you know, these these key opinion leaders in Australia are wheeled out to to say, well, yes, we knew that all along, but that doesn't mean that antidepressants aren't great drugs for, for anybody who takes them. So that, they're not sort of directly motivated by industry to do that. Um, so you've got that voice, the voice of, of apparently well-intentioned, um, well-qualified public citizens, and then you've got the direct lobbying that's, as you rightly point out, that there are more lobbyists in Washington than there are Congress members so uh, pharmaceutical lobbyists. Um, so the idea that it, you're not just, the political pressure is not just being applied from one direction, it's coming from multiple directions. And I mean, I think as Lehman's pointed out in our book about, you know, it, it, it is a product and celebration of neoliberalism 
that um, and our health is is not something that should be should be prone to that uh, political and and economic approach and dramatic creep in in terms of identifying things to treat as you say i i, I seem to remember it was uh, perhaps the one of the senior people in Merck, there's a quote from saying that they wanted uh, Merck to be more like, you know, their products more like Wrigley's chewing gum, something that people just have every day rather than to, you know, to be seen solely as treating diseases. Exactly. And that shapes the, the research agenda as well. Diseases that kill, tropical diseases, for example, that kill and disable millions and millions of people get relatively little research from industry because if they do find a treatment, it would most likely be something that people take for a couple of weeks and then they stop taking it. So there's not the same level of profit in it. Thank you, John. I was also personally quite interested to read that, um, John, as I'm sure you know, there's been this issue about withdrawal effects from antidepressants and this idea that withdrawal problems are mild and self-limiting over a couple of weeks. And we know that came from the pharmaceutical industry, but I was interested to read that the genesis for that might actually have been from a disagreement about the withdrawal effects of paroxetine being a short half-life drug and fluoxetine being a longer half-life drug and two pharmaceutical companies essentially trying to has argue each other as to which was the easiest to withdraw from. Yeah, so fluoxetine um, Prozac was the was the first and you know was losing its market share to paroxetine or Paxil um, and part of it was the uh, the more energising effect of Paxil because it's a shorter acting drug and a, quite a nasty drug, but that's by the by. And so um, the makers of Lily, the makers of fluoxetine, found a way of getting back at, at uh, GSK by saying, well, your drug's going to have more withdrawal effects because ours is a longer acting drug and won't won't create the same problems. It's a rare example of of vigorous competition, though, between companies because more of the time um, what's good for Glaxo is good for um, Lilly because, you know, I, I if, if you promote fluoxetine, doctors aren't necessarily going to prescribe fluoxetine. They're just going to recognise that there's not a lot of difference between different antidepressants. So if uh, Lilly are busily doing something that increases the sales of fluoxetine, they'll also be increasing the sales of paroxetine. So market size is probably a bigger issue for companies than market share. So you end the book with what you call a radical proposal, and we've talked a little bit about that in terms of having trials independently assessed and you know the data taken out of industry. But you know, I, I wondered what else you felt there was that we could look to to achieve intellectual honesty. And you know, I'm thinking of things maybe like the the restoring invisible and abandoned trials initiative that I, I know you've been involved with. So you know, are there other things happening that might start to chip away at this uh, monumental problem? Yeah, I think the the Restoring Invisible and Abandoned Trials, the RIAD initiative, I and mean, we've been involved with two of those, and I think it's a great initiative, but you know, maybe half a dozen studies have been done. And one thing that you recognise is how incredibly time expensive it is to do this kind of work and how difficult it is to get it published. So um, it's very relatively easy for, for the company to get their shoddily reported study published in the first place, it, you wouldn't believe how hard it was for us to get our BMJ study on reanalyzing study 329. I mean, we had 27 pages of reviews on the first submission. Um, there was six months of toing and froing between us and the BMJ. We were, you know, people were at each other's throats. It was an incredibly demanding, stressful process. And in the end, the BMJ were very flattering about it and Fiona Godley said it was one of the proudest moments as, of hers as the editor of the BMJ, but they didn't make us feel like that. We felt like we were having to justify every full stop and capital letter, whereas the people who'd published the trial initially, albeit not in the BMJ, you know, had just sort of had ghostwriters prepare it, present it to one um journal, get rejected, um, present it to another one, do about half of what the reviewers asked them to do, and there it was in print. 
at the end of the book, there are um, in the appendices there are a number of letters presented that that um, your or Lehman wrote to senior people in pharmaceuticals, to journal editors, and, and to many others. So you, you kind of get some sense there of really quite how difficult a job this is, and that you must feel like you're bashing your head against a brick wall most of the time. Yeah, and interestingly, I was at a, at a conference. Um, in Sydney um, a while ago, that the title of which was Truth Decay, and it was about the um, a range of things affecting health, where um, you know post truth um, politics were were having a negative impact, and um, and one of the presentations by a, a, a lovely man and and you know very smart in what he was doing was about conspiracy theories in health. And interestingly, his chosen topic was um, people who criticise antidepressants. So <laughs> um, here was an academic who thought that our criticism of antidepressants was actually manifesting a conspiracy theory rather than good science. So the odds are against us, really, in trying to in try and have an impact. Thank you, John. The book goes into some detail about ghostwriting and the ghost management of clinical trial reports. So I wondered if you could share with us some of what you found about that during your research. So the most egregious example of ghostwriting that I've come across in ghost management was in the citalopram study, um, where there's through legal um, action, there's been access to company documents. And one of them has a... um, a person from the ghostwriting agency uh, writing to a person from marketing in Forest Pharmaceuticals saying, um, it's not clear yet who's going to write this paper, in brackets, as opposed to who's going to be the author, close brackets. So what they're saying is they haven't quite decided who in their team is going to prepare the manuscript, much less who they're going to claim to have written the paper who's going to be listed as the author um, on on the manuscript and we've you know we see drafts of the manuscript prepared by the medical writing agency as they call themselves and passed over to forest marketing backwards and forwards and at a very advanced stage of development out of courtesy more or less the the manuscript is sent to Karen Wagner um, who's the named first author uh, for her to, you know, kind of make a few editorial comments before the company or the medical writer then submits it to a journal, um, choosing a journal um, that would prefer a brief report so they can get away with not reporting some of the negative findings that would be required in a more extensive report of, of, their, of their paper. So, I mean, ghostwriting is a problem academically in that it shouldn't be the case that somebody claims credit, scientific credit for writing a paper that they haven't written. But from a patient's point of view, that doesn't really matter. As long as the as long as the science is accurately represented, a patient doesn't really care whether Karen Rag- Wagner really wrote that paper or not. But what a patient does care about is whether the the science is accurately accurately represented. So the bigger problem than ghostwriting is ghost management, where the whole process of what's put into the paper and how the science is distorted is controlled by the company through their, through their medical writing agencies. And that does matter to patients because it means that false information, potentially fatal information, is, is included in published articles. Yeah, absolutely. There are some chilling examples in the books of the the kind of you see the interface, don't you, between the science and marketing messages and where the two don't line up. There's some real sleight of hand to finesse the wording of these things such that um, you know, well, I I guess in you know, as far as turning a, a negative result into a positive result in some trials. Yeah. And where it's where it's most dodgy is in the reporting of adverse events. I mean, the, the riot reanalyses we've done have not turned out to be dramatically different in the, in the um, efficacy findings. It's, it's the way it's reported that's the problem there, the spin that's put on it. But what's really bad is the way in which adverse events are uh, hidden 
um, and quite deliberately and cynically. And so um, I think probably the most important thing in our um, study 329 reanalysis that was published in the BMJ um, is a table where we, we describe 10 ways in which adverse events can be hidden or misrepresented in, in publications. And, and they're all incredibly common and used very widely. Could you give us some examples of those? So that what, what, one that I do recall was clumping together adverse events to make them look, you know, uh, as if they're kind of, you know, more more general and not so serious. So if you if you've got um, some severe psychiatric adverse events, you create a category called neurological events, and you make psychiatry psychiatric events a sub section of that, and then you compare the overall figures, and of course. Headaches go into that category and they're incredibly common, so the, the noise drowns out the signal. Or alternatively, if you've got a, a drug that has an activating effect that can cause nasty side effects like akathisia, you give different patients different labels and, so, and then you say you've got to have a 5 it's got to occur 5% of the time in 5% of patients to be reportable. And so by dividing it up, you don't reach the threshold of 5%. Or you rename something. So in the study 329, they grouped uh, kids who'd made suicide attempts under the category of emotional lability. So any clinician seeing the, the label emotional lability would think, oh, well, the drug made them you know, laugh a bit outlandishly or cry a bit inappropriately. But no, that's actually code for suicide attempts. And, and you know, study 329, is, I guess, perhaps one of the more well-known uh, examples of this and being in the public domain, but has Study 329 ever been retracted? No, and, and you, you would have seen from the book, uh, I mean, it's quite amusing look, looking back on it now. It wasn't very amusing at the time, but, you know, we wrote to the journal. When the, when the journal editor changed, we wrote to the new editor. We wrote to Brown University, who were the, the main, where the main author or named author came from, we wrote to GSK. Um, we occasionally got replies, but no action. Absolutely. So you know that there are, you know, presumably, uh, theoretically, I guess, prescribers out there who could still look at that study as a basis for, you know, the safety and efficacy of prescribing that particular product. And yet, it's been comprehensively debunked, hasn't it? Yeah, you know, we did an analysis. So we, ha- we haven't done it for a few years, but for a while there, we did um, every few years we'd do. Um, a literature search on citations of, of that Keller article of Study 329. And we were finding up to quite recently that anything up to 30 or 40 percent of, of citations of it were either positive or at least uncritical. And if, in fact, I think only a, a small minority were actually critical, citing it in a way that, that acknowledged its shortcomings. And so, John, you know, is there an answer to ghostwriting? I mean, I guess going back to your earlier um, suggestion of if we could take, um, you know, the whole business of clinical trials out of industry and make it independent, presumably that would also deal with issues of ghostwriting because it would then become about the science, not about the marketing message that's applied post hoc to the science. Exactly. And, and the closest we can get, I can get to that in advising um, young doctors is um, – only read the methods and results of the paper, because actually, in the, in the in the original publication of study three two nine, what was written in the methods and results about efficacy was accurate if you knew how to look at it, um, but what was written in the abstract and conclusions was entirely misleading. Now that didn't require that didn't provide any protection against the misleading nature of the way adverse events were reported, but it did. Re- did provide some protection against being led to draw incorrect conclusions as as people were with that study. Yeah, it must be quite a, a challenge, I guess, for you know prescribers to you know to, I guess to look at trials and read anything more than the abstract. You know, if if they're interested in such things, because they're under so much time pressure that you know they they probably don't have the time or resource to go into the you know the individual conclusions and look at the data analysis and look at the statistics. So they're probably just going by some very high level messages in the abstract, aren't they? Yes, but it only becomes an issue if that paper is going to change your practice. 
So if you if there are a couple of ways in which you can protect yourself from making bad decisions about prescribing drugs that have been misrepresented, the first is to favour old drugs over new drugs because if a drug's been around for a long time, it's likely that any adverse effects of it have become more, more obvious and more apparent. So if it's survived, that's probably a good thing. The, the second thing is, is to restrict yourself to one or two drugs from any class and get to know those drugs well and only be motivated to change those drugs if you've got strong grounds to think that there's a dramatic um, benefit to be gained from a new drug. And, you know, there, there are drug bulletins around that doctors can use that provide a kind of screening for that. So Prescrea, the French drug bulletin, um, will, will tell you if a, if a new drug that comes on the market is, is worthy of consideration. And then if you are thinking of using a new drug or treatment, then you do need to spend a lot of time looking in detail at the data. You can't rely on guidelines. Um, and my advice is to form a critical appraisal group, kind of like a journal club, but to find somebody who can mentor um, a group of physicians in strongly critically appraising literature. But you don't have to do it very often because new drugs or new treatments that are going to change your practice don't actually come along that often. It looks like they do because new drugs come onto the market, but most of them are me too drugs like you know, all of the antidepressants that came along after fluoxetine and, and don't require your attention. One more thing is about, is about surrogate measures, the idea that, that um, a lot of misleading information comes from um, placing too much credence on things like changes in blood pressure or lipid levels or, in the case of psychiatry, symptom measures without looking at uh, mortality or hospitalisation or even quality of life measures that measure more substantial outcomes. So the hierarchy of evidence in the, in the conventional pursuit of evidence-based medicine is based on the methodology that's been used to gather the data. So you know, have a meta-analysis at the top and then a big randomised controlled trial and then cohort studies and then single case studies. But what that doesn't take account of is the importance of what's being measured. So that hierarchy needs to be respected as well. And Viox is probably the best example of something that at the level of symptomatic improvement looked like a really good drug. But once you started to measure important outcomes like hospitalisation and mortality, we discovered that it was a really bad drug. And, and, and there's, a, there's a long list of drugs that have looked really good when they've first been developed because all that's been measured is the surrogates but have turned out to be really bad drugs once the more important measures like hospitalisation and mortality have been, have been investigated, it turns out this drug does more harm than good. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and as you said earlier, it might be decades before there's enough data available on the, the effects of that drug in a clinical setting. Yeah, but usually, it's usually um, with Viox, it was years rather than decades. So if people had stuck with the old drug for just a while, it would have been long enough for them to avoid um, the new drug. So, you know, early, it's great to be an early adopter if you're buying a new computer or a fridge or something like that. Um, but it's not a good idea to be an early adopter with medical treatments. John, thank you so much for uh, spending some time with me today to talk about your book. Um, it's very accessible, but it's very sobering reading, um, and it, it makes clear how evidence-based medicine has been corrupted by corporate interests, failed regulation, and the commercialization of academia. So um, I hope that initiatives like Restoring Invisible and Abandoned Trials and the, the setting up of journals free from industry influence help to restore some balance. And, you know, I... I as we mentioned earlier, I can't imagine how difficult it is to set yourselves up in opposition to 
people in some of the most profitable businesses on earth who seem to have an endless supply of money to invest in marketing and in legal protection and in influencing and, and all the rest of it. So I think it's an incredibly brave thing to do. So thank you for your work, John. Thank you very much for having me. Well, I just want to thank John so much for taking the time to chat. And I really do encourage you to read his book, The Illusion of Evidence-Based Medicine, as it's eye-opening and shocking too. You can also visit the website of the Restoring Invisible and Abandoned Trials Project at restoringtrials.org. So as always, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.